Well, good morning. And I want to bring you warm greetings from your brothers and sisters in Christ at Reformation Bible Church in Concord, cold, secular, Concord, New Hampshire. Um, say that because, well, it's so kind here. And I said yesterday, this land just seems very gentle. Where we're from seems very harsh. And, but you would love uh, the congregation at Reformation Bible Church, and I know that they would love you. Um, it really is an honor and a privilege to be here this morning. Um, Pastor Dana and Chris were, to my wife, Carissa, and I, a real uh, uh, gift from the Lord in that year that they were with us at the founding of the church, and uh, they had been through some difficulties in ministry as we had, and, and were really uh, came alongside us, and so it's a blessing all these years later to be, to be here. Also this morning, we have a few uh, that we've brought from New Hampshire, uh, actually relatives of Pastor Dana's. Tom Osborne is an elder. He's here this morning. Uh, Keith Carter is one of our deacons, Dana's brother-in-law, and um, Asa, Tom's son, and, uh, and then my daughter Ruthie came up this morning from Cedarville and just saw her a few minutes ago. So this is a special time to be here with you. I want to encourage you this morning, if you would turn with, in your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 13. I almost said 2 Timothy because that's where we were the last few days, but Matthew chapter 13. And this morning, I want to look with you at two verses, Matthew 13, verse 51 and 52. But for the sake of context, I'd like to begin reading in verse 36, Matthew chapter 13, verse 36. Then he, that is Jesus, left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. And he said, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man, and the field is the world. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom, and the tares are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. So just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness, and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in, a, in the field which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea, gathering fish of every kind. And when it was filled, they drew it up on the beach, and they sat down and gathered the good fish into containers, but the bad they threw away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes. And Jesus said to them, therefore, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like a head of a household who brings out of his treasure things new and old. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Would you pray with me? Our God and our Father, we have just learned from your Son, our Lord, that it is not a given that we would understand your truth, that it is of grace that we have our Bibles this morning, that we can hear them read and but now as your word is preached, it is a gift, a grace, if we are to understand. And so we humbly ask your blessing now. In Jesus' name, amen. All around New England, there are town centers where there are these beautiful white buildings with steeples. There are stereotypical almost of New England. If there's a postcard of New England, it's 
typically a postcard of fall foliage in one of the New England towns with this beautiful old white church building with a steeple. But many of those buildings all around New England and New Hampshire, where we are from, they are now worthless. Worthless not as pieces of architecture that speak of a rich history, but worthless because the treasure that they once contained in terms of the word of God read and preached is long gone. There may even be a small congregation gathering in one of those quaint old New England church buildings, but that building is still worthless because what marks a church as valuable is to the extent that the word of God, the Bible, is cherished, read, preached, and obeyed that much and no more. Jesus, in Matthew 13, has been teaching his disciples about the value of the kingdom of heaven. The value of the kingdom of heaven. In verse 44, he, he likens the kingdom of heaven to a treasure hidden in a field. A man found it, and he, he, it's so valuable, he's so excited, he hides it so that he can go and buy the field. The kingdom's like a treasure. In a field, the kingdom, verse 45, is like a fine pearl. Verse 46, a pearl of great value. And the kingdom is like a valuable catch of fish from which the bad fish have been removed. And after telling these parables, Jesus, in verse 51, says to his disciples, these are, these are his 12, these are his close disciples who have come Verse 36, have come to him and have asked him to explain these things. So he's, he's speaking to his 12 disciples and he says now to them in verse 51, have you understood all these things? And they said to him, yes. Now we know from later in the gospel of Matthew that they didn't understand everything. There were many things they didn't understand and they had a special difficulty understand the sufferings of the Messiah. But at this point in verse 51, we, we shouldn't be hard on them. It seems that they're, they're being sincere and humble. Yes, they, they actually do understand. They're starting to get what Jesus is saying about the, the inestimable valuable value of the kingdom. Yes, they say. And the fact that they did grasp something of the significance and the truth of what Jesus was saying is, is remarkable in the context. Because for a while now, Jesus has been speaking in parables. If you go back over to chapter 13, verse 3, it says there he spoke many things to them in parables. Now, for years now, and I, I heard some of this when I was in seminary and training, and, but it's been very popular in evangelical circles. If you're training young preachers to point to the parables of Jesus and to say, see, there's Jesus. Jesus tells, told stories in the pulpit and, and um, you know, he tried to really use parables in order to relate to people, to, to kind of get down to their level and to make it understandable. And they completely, those who are saying that today, completely miss the point of what the scriptures is saying. The parables were not given to make things more understandable. In a fearful and frightening way, Jesus started speaking in parables as a judgment upon Israel. It was a fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 6. Look with me at chapter 13, Matthew 13, verse 14. It quotes from Isaiah chapter 6. Matthew 13, 14. In this, their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, You will keep on hearing but will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull. With their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they would see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and return, and I would heal them. The parables were not given to make things more clear. They were given as a judgment 
to begin hiding the truth from the people who had rejected Jesus, the greatest preacher that has ever walked on the face of the earth. For over a year, he had been preaching plainly, clearly from the Old Testament scriptures. And there has never been a preacher like Jesus. But the people have been enjoying his miracles, enjoying his healings and so forth. But as far as the message of this young guy from that backward town named Nazareth, eh, we're not so sure about his message. And most damning, they refused to admit the obvious, which they, they were asking. They were saying, this cannot be the Messiah, can it? They, they knew that that was a reasonable question to ask, but it was obvious that he was because he so completely fulfilled all of the prophecies that had been given through the prophets concerning the Messiah. This is how you know what the Messiah is going to be like when he comes. And he fulfilled them, and yet they refused their king and their Messiah. Israel, by this point, in chapter 13, has effectively rejected her king, except for a very few. And so Jesus has been teaching and preaching in parables, and the people do not understand them. The only ones that understand the significance of the parables, and the only reason why we have any clue as to what those parables were about, is because Jesus actually takes the time to explain them. For example, we read this morning in verse 36 that he began to explain to them the parable of the wheat and the tares. We'd be making up our meaning if Jesus hadn't explained it. And so when verse 51, when the disciples say, yes, we understand, this is incredible. This is amazing. This is a gift. It's a, it's a tribute not to their brilliance. We know that they were a little slow and, and we're thankful because we're a little slow. So, so, praise God, he can work with slow people, make disciples of them. But they say, yes, we understand. And that is a tribute to the grace of God, to the mercy of God, that they understand, they're beginning to understand the value of the kingdom. Jesus says, have you understood all these things? They say, yes. And then Jesus says in verse 52, Therefore, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like a head of a household or brings out of his treasure things new and old. Israel had rejected her king by and large at this point. And on the lead edge of the movement to reject Jesus, on the leading edge were the scribes. The scribes. Most guilty of all in relation to rejecting the plain truth of the prophecies about the Messiah, rejecting Jesus, were the scribes. Now, who were the scribes? They're often, we think of the scribes and the Pharisees. We're a little more familiar usually with the Pharisees. But the scribes were the expert teachers in the law and the word of God. They were kind of the Old Testament scholars, you might say. When Herod, for example, wanted to know just what these magi were talking about, when, when Herod wanted to know where is, does the Old Testament say that the Messiah will be born, in Matthew chapter 2, verse 4, he calls for the chiefs, priests, and scribes. Not only were the scribes expert scholars in Old Testament, they were effectively, they were teachers. That was their primary role, they were teachers. In Matthew chapter 7, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, the people are in awe of Jesus' preaching and teaching because, Matthew says, Jesus was teaching them as one having authority, not as their scribes. So the scribes were primarily teachers. And the scribes, who of all people should have known the messianic prophecies and seen their obvious fulfillment in Jesus, instead were the first to charge Jesus, the Son of God, with blasphemy. In Matthew chapter 9, a paralytic was brought to Jesus lying on a bed and, and seeing their faith, Matthew says in chapter 9, verse 2, Jesus said to the paralytic, Take courage, son, your sins are forgiven. And some of the scribes said to themselves, This fellow 
this Jesus blasphemes. The scribes had taken the lead in antagonizing Jesus and rejecting him. In a sense, the large-scale rejection of Jesus as Messiah was fueled by the scribes. What a tragedy. And what a wicked neglect of their responsibility and their failure to steward the gift of the Old Testament scriptures. For the Old Testament scriptures are a treasure. They are a treasure. I'm so thankful that you read this morning. I uh, wasn't expecting that from 1 Kings. That, that, that's great. And, uh, you know, you don't know how the Lord's going to use that. But just think of it. How many houses of worship around the nation today is 1 Kings chapter, was it 2, being read? Not much. And one of the reasons, I need to say this, why we need to read the Bible more in church is because we need to have a healthy understanding that not as many people are actually reading their Bibles, especially that Old Testament, as much as we might think. It's a treasure house, the Old Testament. Psalm 19, verse 10. I think Pastor Dana may have read this yesterday. It says concerning this, the words of God, they are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold. Or Psalm 119, verse 127, concerning the words of God. Therefore, says the psalmist, O God, I love, I love your commandments above gold. Yes, fine gold. Well, imagine, imagine a great king had given a man, had chosen a man to be a, a steward, to, be, to, to give this man, a great king gave another man a responsibility of providing for his beloved children while the king was away. To provide for his children and for his citizens out, while the king was away. And imagine that the king, the great king, gave to this steward the keys to his treasure house. And that the king commanded the steward to regularly bring out of that treasure house for his children and citizens various treasures for their supply and for their delight and for their joy. And to remind them while the king was away that his children were loved and his citizens were loved. But then the steward, who the king had left in charge of the treasure house, took the key that had been entrusted to him, and instead of bringing out various treasures for the king's children and citizens, instead the steward, imagine, he kept the storehouse hidden from them. And imagine the steward instead brought to the children trinkets of his own making and little baubles and, and little, instead of the rich clothing that the king had set aside for them, he brought out, you know, stuff that he had made out of sackcloth. And the children over time and, the, and the, the citizens over time think, well, okay, I guess this is all there is. What a wicked thing that would be. For the children would think that their, their father, the king, was not so rich and loving after all. And the citizens might, might wonder what kind of king they have. That is essentially what the scribes in Jesus' day were doing. And that is essentially what is happening, sadly, all over in churches, at least in our part of this country today. Pastors who are charged with the prim primary responsibility of reading the word of God and explaining to God the great king's children and the citizens of heavenly kingdom opening up the scriptures and providing for them treasures, treasures that point to the, the treasure of the kingdom of heaven. And of course, the greatest treasure of the kingdom is the king himself, our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a tragedy that in all around New England, and that's why those white, pretty buildings are now worthless because the treasure of the scriptures are no longer brought forth there. Jesus in Matthew 23, verse 13 says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people. 
By withholding the treasure, they kept the people from knowledge of their king. Well, in verse 52 of Matthew 13, by asserting that a true scribe is a disciple of the kingdom, Jesus says, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven. By asserting that a true scribe is a disciple of the kingdom, Jesus effectively condemns the scribes of his day. This is significant. I mean, these are, these are the, the praised scholars. These are the esteemed doctors, if you will, of, of the, their day. And Jesus condemns them. They are not disciples of the kingdom and therefore they are no scribes. And they have, because they are not disciples of the kingdom, they have nothing and worse than nothing for the people. Jesus makes it clear, a scribe who is not a disciple of the kingdom is bankrupt. And despite his learning, he has nothing, nothing to share with the people because he is not being a steward of the treasure that was given to him. But, by way of contrast, a scribe who is a disciple of the kingdom has a treasure. He has a treasure. He's like, he's like the head of a household who brings out of his treasure things new and old. A scribe who is a disciple of the kingdom has a treasure and brings out of it things new and old. To share with others. Who might these scribes who are disciples of the kingdom be? Who are they? It's a little bit enigmatic. It's a little bit mysterious. Who who is Jesus referring to? Well, I believe they're sitting right in front of him. These scribes who are disciples are are the twelve. Now, one of them will, Judas, will not be around, and then They will add the 12th, and of course, we'll have the Apostle Paul. But these are the men. These are the scribes. These men, these fishermen, this tax collector, (laughs) this odd assortment of men who don't have that background that the scribes have, nonetheless, after three years with the greatest preacher and teacher the earth will ever see, they, in gifted by Jesus and indwelt by the Spirit of Christ, will become, like him, the greatest teachers and preachers the church has ever seen. These men, the disciples who will become the apostles and the greatest expositors of the Old Testament, will also be the ones by whom the Holy Spirit will give the New Testament. Now, there are some commentators... And I was a little bit nervous thinking about preaching this text this morning because I must be upfront that there are some who say, well, verse 52, not so sure that that treasure is an allusion to the scriptures and the Old Testament and the New Testament. But, But here's my brilliant exegetical insight. What else could it be? (laughs) What else could the treasure be? Than the scriptures. Jesus has been preaching and teaching the Old Testament scriptures. He's condemned the scribes because they did not understand and teach the plain meaning of the Old Testament scriptures. He's been explaining to them the value of the scriptures. And a scribe was one who is expressly devoted to the study of the scriptures. So what else can the treasure be than the New and Old Testament? Certainly, Jesus cannot be referring to men who are just coming up with with brilliant thoughts or ideas and sharing their insight. After all, listen to this from Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 28. I love this verse. It's very sobering. But all that more pastors understood this and more church members understood this, listen to what God says about how serious he is about those who are prophets or pastors, teachers, sticking to his word. Jeremiah 23, verse 28, God says, the prophet or the preacher who has a dream may relate his dream, but let him who has my word speak my word in truth. What does straw have in common with grain? Grain. 
One of the dear members and a friend of mine in our church, Charlie Jaworski, is a farmer. And uh, when he comes in, and we get together on Tuesday mornings to pray, and I'll ask him how he's doing, and then I ask him, he's, he has a few cows, and tell me about his little cow, and just tell me, you know, oh yeah, they're out in the pasture, and the grass is green, they like that, but oh, when I put grain in their bin, you should see how they come in. And they're getting so fat, because they just want that grain, and he spoils them. I don't, I'm not a farmer. I think, though, given the choice, a horse or a cow will take grain, compared to some nasty, dry, old straw lacking nutrition. We are not to, in the church, share our own thoughts, our own opinions. We are not to come up with our own visions, our own dreams. We need our churches increasingly to care less what the latest fads or opinions might be and to demand of those who stand in the pulpit, read us that Bible, preach to us that Bible, and then sit down and then pray for us during the week that we understand and apply what you preach to us. I say this partly with passion because as a young man, as a young preacher, um, I was under the influence of some, and I don't know, I call it the cool hip church movement. And, you know, I mean, I, I could use a little help. My daughters try to help me to be a little bit cooler. Um, it's, it's a hard work. It's getting harder as the years go by. But, you know, I mean, I was taught in seminary to preach the Bible, but yet I felt that I had to share so many illustrations because, you know, otherwise there's no way I was going to get people's attention. I had to come up with this killer illustration at the beginning of the sermon to get people's attention. And so I would, yeah, I'd study the text. I'd have the main idea, but then I'd have all these illustrations I'd talk about. And I was, I was a intern and a youth pastor in a larger church and and I was I there was no senior pastor at that time and so I had the opportunity to preach regularly and so on one Sunday I I preached one of my sermons with all these illustrations and so forth and and I received some rave reviews from people oh that was great and I went home to my godly wife and you, you need to know my wife is a very kind quiet woman you know and as a young preacher tends to do maybe older preachers too What'd you think? You know, I'm thinking she loved it. <laughs> and my wife had been reared in a godly home where she'd sat under expository preaching, that is preaching that sticks close to the text. And, and very gently in love, she said to me, well, honey, that was nice, but where's the text? I've been to seminary, woman. What do you mean, where's the text? <laughs> she was right. Our job is to read the word of God and to explain it and to exhort with it. Well, Jesus had been preaching and teaching the Old Testament scriptures, but he'd also been providing new revelation. He is, after all, the king. He is the one who has given the word. He is God the Son. And now upon the heels of his disciples beginning to understand the truths of the kingdom, Jesus effectively looks at his disciples who will be the apostles, the foundation of the church, and, and he, he, he puts upon them now this new privilege that they are going to be like scribes. They are going to be the new teachers. And they are going to bring out to God's people treasures old and new. Think of the unique role of the apostles with me for a few moments. The New Testament was written largely by the apostles or their close associates, men who were immediately around them. Every one of the New Testament letters has the fingerprint of the apostles of Jesus Christ upon it. Even Hebrews, where we don't know who the human author is, but it has, it has apostolic authority all over it. The New Testament scriptures are remarkable in part, not just because they're new, but also because the degree to which the Old Testament scriptures are opened up for us in the New Testament. You can't read a New Testament letter without a reference to the Old Testament scriptures. 
Hebrews is, is an example of that. It's just, it's just one long exposition of the Old Testament of how it points to Christ. Often overlooked in the opening chapter of Acts is the sudden appearance of the apostles on the scene. If you, if you think it in the Gospels, and these guys are kind of bumbling along, and they're not getting it, and they fail, and Peter fails. and I mean, it's just not, the whole cause, the whole movement isn't looking so good. And then in chapter 1, after Jesus gives instructions to his apostles, boom, after praying and waiting for the filling of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, suddenly Peter stands up and he preaches on the day of Pentecost an exposition of the Old Testament scriptures. He's a scribe. Stephen, at his defense, gives an exposition of the Old Testament scriptures. And wherever Paul went and taught and preached, he reasoned from the Old Testament scriptures. Just turn with me for a moment to Acts chapter 28, verse 23, at the end of the book of Acts. I think this is an illustration of what Jesus is referring to when he says that the scribe who's a disciple of the kingdom will bring forth treasures old and new. Acts 28. There we find that Paul is in prison, but he's in a low security, minimum security prison. He's able to have people come and go, and, and he's using the opportunity. And he says in Chapter 28, verse 23, when the, they had set a day for Paul, the Jews who came to him in his lodging in large numbers, and he was explaining to them, listen, by solemnly testifying about the kingdom of God and trying to persuade them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets from morning to, until evening. A scribe who is a disciple of the kingdom will be like, the head of a household who brings out of his treasure old and new. Paul was continually opening up the Old Testament scriptures, not putting a new meaning on them, by the way. That's not what happens in the New Testament. All the New Testament does is just help us understand the truth that was there all along. God does not speak. He does not misspeak. He doesn't say, oh, I tried in the Old Testament, uh, I really gave it a shot, but um, boy, you know, I guess I better start, you know, Bible point two. He's God. His word is true. He's wise. He knows what he was speaking. All his word is holy, inerrant, infallible, and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. We learned this when Pastor Dana preached yesterday in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Paul says to Timothy, continue, Timothy, in the things you've learned and become convinced of, knowing of whom you've learned them, and that from your childhood you've known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation. What were those sacred writings at that time that Timothy knew from childhood? The Old Testament. The Old Testament is sufficient to lead us to the knowledge of salvation? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank God, though, that's not all we have. At the same time, the apostles were used of God and of Christ to reveal truths not previously revealed or made clear in the Old Testament. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, Let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Stewards of the mysteries of God. A mystery in the New Testament is not something that's, oh boy, we just don't know. A mystery is something that previously was unclear or hidden, but now by the Holy Spirit through the apostles has been made plain. For example, another text, if you want to, why don't you turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3. This is an example. Again, what we're looking at is illustrations, examples from the scriptures of what Jesus means when he says a scribe is like one who brings out of his treasure things old and new. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, the Apostle Paul says, To me, the very least of saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles 
the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery, which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things, so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. Paul was given the grace to make known the unfathomable riches of Christ. And he refers up in verse 3 of Ephesians 3 that there was a revelation made known to him, a mystery. But then he shares what the mystery is, that the Gentiles, verse 6, are now fellow heirs and fellow members of the body of Christ. The apostles were used of God in the New Testament to not only reveal to us things, the the truths in the Old Testament that maybe we did not as see clearly as before, but we have now in the New Testament scriptures new revelation from God. With the scribes of Jesus' day abusing their privilege, squandering their stewardship, King Jesus, King Jesus designated new scribes who would bring out of the treasure house of God's word Not only old treasures, but new. And we have this treasure house now in our hands. We are a blessed people. I was reading recently a little bit about William Tyndale, who worked tirelessly to translate the scriptures into the English language. On October 6th, just a few weeks ago, was the anniversary of when he was chained to a stake and burned. Why? Because he insisted that the people of England needed to have the Bible in their own language. Some before that, some of the Lollards, they were... Um, men who were returning to the scriptures and it was illegal in those days in England to even know the English Bible, to, to say the words of scripture in English. They were, they were executed because they taught their children the Lord's Prayer in English as opposed to Latin. We have a treasure in the Bible. Now, I, I know you've heard this before. Uh, this, is, this is a church that obviously you're reading the Bible, you're preaching the Bible. That's why you're here. You're not, you're not coming to this church for any other reason, probably. Although maybe soup. I, that, could, that could have an influence. This is a good day to come. Is this soup day? Is that what you called it? I think the Lord's Day and Soup Day goes together well. But you're coming here because you want the Bible. But brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to learn from our Lord and and remember again just what a stewardship we have. And we who have the responsibility of preaching and teaching, whether it be in the pulpit, Sunday school class, it's wonderful to hear this morning, uh, uh, teaching from the book of Joshua, whether you're teaching little ones, so, so wonderful kids, Kids, it's really good you're here this morning, that you're hearing the Bible. This is your treasure too. And those who teach you, mom and dads, we have a treasure. So here's the question this morning. What will we do with this stewardship, with this treasure? We need to be praying, and I know this sounds harsh. I do. In our area, we are, we are overrun with churches supposedly that preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and yet you can go there week after week and walk away and you don't know anything more about the Bible or about your Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm praying they'll close. Is that unkind? You know what is unkind? What is unkind is when the sheep that God purchased with the blood of his own son The flock of God are malnourished, starving, 
frightened, scattered on the hills because the word that God gave to nourish them, feed them, remind them of his love has been stripped from them, hoarded in a treasure house, and guys are coming out and they're removing the word of God and just sharing the latest little thought they had. That's unkind. So we have a zero tolerance now. We, we, it's time. I mean, things, things, is it clear now that we need to be faithful to the word of God in the days that we're in? It's time we're done with the games. It's time with church being, it's time for church to be done being like, like junior high youth group. No offense to the junior hires. I love junior hires. But, you know, we all got to grow up. And it's time for us to grow up. It's time for God's people reverently, respectfully to demand their right that their king entrusted to them treasures old and new. And the greatest treasure of all, this, this treasure is not the end. This, we revere the word of God. We, we respect the word of God. We, we stand at times in reverence for the word of God. But the reason why we are to revere the treasure of the word of God, the word, the treasure house of the kingdom, is because it's here that we learn about our king. And we will not know him, and we will not love him, and we will not serve him as we ought. Unless someone comes, takes the gift that God has given them by the Holy Spirit to understand the scriptures, and opens the treasure house, and brings out to us precious things about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What will we do with this stewardship? May God help us to be stewards. Otherwise, this building that Lord willing Reformation Bible Church is going to purchase after 12 years of the church existing. I told our folks just a few weeks ago as I was reflecting on this passage. The moment that our church ceases to read and preach the Bible. That building will become absolutely worthless and another blight upon the landscape of New England. May God continue this place, this house of worship, to be a treasure house in Logansville in this area. That men and women, boys and girls, may know their great King and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Oh God, thank you for giving us the scriptures that we can come here this morning and not guess what you think or what you want us to know, but that you have revealed your will and your word to us and most of all your son to us. We thank you for our Bibles. Forgive us for where we've been neglecting them, maybe haven't read them in a while. Forgive, forgive us if we've been giving priority to, to all kinds of sorts of other things other than attending to the reading and preaching of your word. Be with those who have the solemn responsibility of teaching the scriptures and preaching them. Have mercy, O oh God, for we are mere men. Hear our hunger in these days for you, the living God. We're weary and tired of what this world has to offer. It's left us empty and starving. O oh God, we want you. We desire you and your son above all things. And so towards that end, we pray, please give a fresh preaching and hearing of your word in our day. End this famine for the hearing of the words of the Lord in your mercy and grace. For you are a God who is abounding in mercy and compassion. And we will receive from your hand with gratitude and thankfulness and bless you all our days. We thank you in our King's name. Amen.